Hi everyone, um, so my name is Sandy Walsh. I'm going to give you a quick little overview of StackTac version 3. It's early in StackTac version 3 development, uh, so we're going to just give you an overview of some of the components that we're building. One of the design criteria we've taken for StackTac v3 is to make everything very, very modular. So most all the components have their own pip installer uh, and you can work with the package that way. So if there's a piece of StackTac V3 you like, you can use it in your own application. Everything has been very decomposed. So the purpose of that, that can be a little bit daunting at first if you, if you look at StackTac V3 and try and understand what, how, all, how all the pieces fit together. So this presentation is going to go through all those pieces, show you how they fit together, and try and explain some of the rationale for why we did it that way. So StackTac V2 was the one that most people have deployed currently. It was based on Django, of course it was written in Python, but basically StackTac v2 was our introduction into debugging and audit and billing for OpenStack applications based on events coming out of the system. It works very well. It's deployed in uh, large environments, but it's a little bit rigid in terms of how it deals with notifications and the type of notifications it can process and the pipeline processing is a little bit rigid as well. Everything's hard-coded, uh, which gets a little bit clunky you know, as you want to bring in new services. Down at the bottom of this screen here, you'll notice there's a link to a YouTube video, which is the Hong Kong Summit presentation that we did about integrating StackTac V2, or our design, our design lessons that we learned um, from StackTac V2 to bring that into Solometer. But since then, we've decided to go with StackTac v3, which is a complete rewrite, and it's independent of all things OpenStack. It's, it has very minimal install requirements and dependencies. And, but if you want to understand why some, some of the design criteria, you know, how we came up with this concept of pipelines and streams, and how we're dealing with scalability and configuration, that video is a, is a great one to get started on because it, it gives you all the background history about Solometer and StackTac v2 and all the new features that we're doing. It's just that StackTac v3 is just a dip different implementation strategy for it. Yagi is a, uh, a library for, proce <clears throat> for processing notifications. It consumes from RabbitMQ and uh, it uh, can dump them uh, the notifications that it grabs almost anywhere. It's a, it's, a, it's a dumb little system, but it's very fast, very efficient, and very reliable. So it can consume notifications at, you know, and send them out to other places. And that's, that's our key place where we're going to hook into. Yagi is our sort of our launching point for a lot of the pieces in StackTac v3. Atom Hopper is a library that was developed within Rackspace. Uh, it's all open source as well, but it allows you to do atom feed processing. So you can send JSON payloads into Atom Hopper and then those will get turned into RSS or well, Atom feeds, kinda of like RSS, but Atom feeds that can be used for downstream consumers. So it's a it's a very cool system. And also Atom Hopper does a lot of our archiving as well. Well we'll talk about that some more though. So these are just some some terms to get familiar with. But I, again, I encourage you to go look at that other video because it uh, gives you a lot of necessary background. So the way StackTac v2 is deployed currently is that we have OpenStack and it publishes notifications out to RabbitMQ. And within, if you want to do billing applications, currently the way we recommend you do it is you publish your notifications at the two different exchanges. One we call a notification dot splat queue or, or uh, exchange and then the other was the monitor one. So we have two consumers, this is the same event going to two different queues. So we have Yagi event which pulls uh, these notifications off the queue and sends them right off to Adam Hopper. And that's sort of our main archiving strategy currently is that we, we pull these events out, we send them off to Adam Hopper and then the downstream billing systems can look at them. In parallel the same notification would also go off to this monitor queue, which StackTac v2 picks up, and it stores the notification in a MySQL database. And then there's various pipeline, uh, primitive pipeline 
operations that occur on there which will look at these events and verify all the billing and audit events that happen within the system and again the the previous video that I mentioned explains this in a lot more detail but what will happen is once verification of usage events has occurred we publish a new dot verified event back into the queue which gets picked up again by Yagi which writes it off to Adam Hopper and then Yagi does a callback to StackTech to say we've written that verified event and then StackTech can update its database to say so now we've got a, a good handoff of a verification of a usage event uh, to the downstream systems. So this works very reliably, it's just a little clunky. Um, for StackTac v3, we're looking at cleaning this up a little bit. We don't want to have two big massive queues over here that we have to watch and manage and maintain. So let's get into StackTac v3 a little bit. So StackTac v3 is our new solution. Like I say, it's a complete rewrite. There's an organization under GitHub for it, uh, slash StackTac. Eventually we will move this over to StackForge. Right now we're just trying to get our, our v1 in place so that we can prove all the concepts and, and move a little faster. Some of the libraries that we've created for this early part of it is, so one of it is a, a thing called Shoebox, and Shoebox is how we're going to archive these raw notifications. Notifications come in very quickly, and they're, they're large, they're probably several K in size of, of JSON payload. And we looked at a lot of different schemes for storing those raw notifications in various databases, we know MongoDB, MySQL, you name it, we looked at a lot of, a lot of different databases. And for our archiving purposes, we realized that we really don't need to go through all that headache of taking this big JSON payload and trying to find a way to store it and archive it uh, or index it because it's, it's mostly archival data. So Shoebox is a little library which will take a JSON payload, write it to disk just like a log file, and then um, just like a rolling log file that can roll on size or roll on time, Shoebox can take these um, JSON payload archives and then hand them off to other systems. So one of the things that we do with Shoebox is we have a Swift handler in there. So after we get, uh, let's say, several megabytes of data or several gigabytes of, of archived event storage, we can upload those into Swift storage so that we can access them later. And again, the idea is that you have multiple, this would plug right into Yagi, and so as the events come in, Yagi will take them, Shoebox will archive them, and Shoebox will then take it and, and push them up into long-term storage. And the intention is that you have many of these Yagi workers that are consuming from the queue in parallel. So you're going to have a lot of different Shoebox archives that are going and, and writing to, uh, to Swift. Uh, we'll give you a demonstration of this later in another video. Uh, as I mentioned, these notifications are big and they're complex, and there's a lot of stuff in there we don't need. Uh, but they do give you a lot of good context around uh, around what's happening in your system. So Stack Distiller is a library that takes these large JSON libraries and breaks them down into a sort of a flattened data structure of just the, the core traits that you need out of an event to do your, your pipeline processing. So you might have you know a, a huge payload for um, a compute instance create event but you only need a dozen of those attributes to actually do your pipeline processing. So Stack Distiller is a great way to de define, here's all the attributes that I want, and here's how you get them out of there. So there's a YAML grammar that's uh, defined in Stack Distiller that you can use for picking out those events, or those, those traits, I should say. And then you can drop the rest of the notification. So out of a 3K payload, let's say, you might only have a, you know, a couple hundred bytes worth of data that you actually need to work with throughout the pipeline. So this is a great way to, to shrink it down into something manageable. And then Cloud Files, of course, which is the, the Rackspace implementation of, of Swift. Uh, and this is where we do a lot of our, our archiving, which I've already talked about. So that's sort of the, the starting point for what we're doing. I'll show you how this works now, with the intention for this, is that similar it, it, it starts off very similar to uh, to the way StackTech v2 works. So you have OpenStack publishing notifications onto Rabbit. Now we just have one queue, which uh, we have multiple Yagi event workers that are pulling these events off the queue. And then the, the Yagi handlers are these. There's a Yagi handler which will send it off to Atom Hopper. There's a Yagi handler that will send it to Shoebox, 
which will store it locally and then push it up into cloud files. There's a handler that will feed it into Stack Distiller, which will plug into other systems. And uh, so what will happen here is Stack Distiller will take this reduced event and then publish it back into RabbitMQ on a, on a different queue, which is a smaller one. And we have more Yagi events that can pick, uh, Yagi event workers that can pick up these new ones and di then do downstream processing on it. Uh, the reason that we publish it back is that we, if something fails over here, we don't want to lose our pipeline. We want to get it back into the system as quickly as possible so that we can keep processing it. So these are different events that are going into the queue now. This is the large payload up here in, in the top one. And then down below, this is the reduced one, which is a very small event, which only has the stuff that we're interested in. Uh, I'm drawing this arrow to say that we're going to go back to RabbitMQ. There's a very good pro probability that we may be sending this into Kafka instead because uh, Kafka has better uh, performance characteristics. And it works well with uh, multiple workers as well. So um, that's, that's still a to-be-determined piece of it, but right now that's, that's the strategy. So now we get into the pipeline piece, and right now we've got sort of two implementations of our pipeline that we're working with. These are going to merge together, um, and and you'll see one one of these. I mean, they're they're both going to live on, but just they're they're sort of they're both tackling the problem from different ends, and they're going to meet in the middle, and then um, you, you'll see how that's going to work. But the pipeline processing is when these reduced notifications come in now um, off the queue, off of Kafka or, or wherever we want to be able to store them in, in various streams and then do processing when we deem that it's necessary. So we've got two libraries for that. One is called Oahu, which is named after the Oahu pipeline in Hawaii. And then we have Winchester, which is the, the trigger system. So um, Winchester stores a lot of these uh, notifi uh, notifications and and the streams in a MySQL database and Oahu is really just the API and the structure around it and the callback mechanism for dealing with the pipelines and the demons and all the rest of it. Um, it just so happens that currently Oahu has uh, a MongoDB driver in it. That's going to get ripped out and it'll become yet another library just like Winchester. So Oahu is the framework for the pipelines Winchester is the MySQL driver for it, which is going to be our high performance one. We'll have another one, which is Mongo, which we probably would only use for testing. Um, Oahu does have a simple implementation inside of it, which is an in-memory one, which works great for, uh, for single dev machines, but you wouldn't want to use it for any sort of uh, you know, concurrent worker situations. Again, I'll explain all this a little bit more uh, in a little bit. but. Right now you can think of Oahu as the API and Winchester as one of the drivers for the pipeline. And what will happen here, this is, this is the same diagram as before, but now you see down below um, we have our Yagi event workers that are taking these reduced notifications off of, off of the queue, feeding it into Oahu with the Winchester driver, and then storing it in MySQL for processing. So now all these events are coming through and we're creating these dynamic streams uh, as the events are flowing through the system. And we can have many of many of these workers in here doing doing the processing. I'll show you how that works a little bit more. So so let's say an event comes in and it's got a, a trade on it, let's say a request ID. And we want to create a stream based on all these events that have a, a, a related trait. So in this case request ID. And and these could you know be spread across several hours of time. And we could have thousands and thousands of these streams running concurrently because you have thousands and thousands of requests that are coming through in a production system. And that's what Oahu does, is it, it, it manages all that. And the drivers, like Winchester, are the ones that actually store it to disk and take care of all the locking mechanisms. Um, any particular stream has basically five states that it can be in. Uh, it can be in, it starts off in the collecting state where events are coming in and we're, we're adding these events to a particular stream. So it's collecting, it's gathering up events, and it's getting ready. Once the criteria for triggering that stream have been met, and that's a, a definable uh, criteria that, you know, there's a YAML grammar for doing that, you, um, the stream will go into a ready state. So now it says, I've got all the events I need. I'm ready to do some processing on it. And then another process will look at any ready streams 
and there'll be a lock that happens here because there's multiple workers going to be looking at looking for these ready streams and then it'll get the lock and then start it'll trigger it'll trigger the stream and it'll process the stream so it'll hand it off to a set of handlers or workers that will run through all the events you, you just get this little reduced set of events that are related to what you're interested in and you can do some work on it so you might want to compute um, a usage activity that happened from there you might want to for performance monitoring, you might have want to find out how long that activity took from start to end. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can do in there. You might want to find out if, if this create instance operation worked successfully, and you can validate that inside your inside your pipeline processing. So this is a very important step here between the ready state and the triggered state. We want to make sure that this is atomic and, and it works successfully. Once it has been processed, it goes into a completed state where we can clean it up and we can delete uh, all the information or it'll go into an error state. Error state will go back into a ready state again so that once any bugs are fixed up any streams that are in error state can go back into ready and then go through the process again. So all the processing steps that happen while in the triggered state have to be idempotent because it, they may actually occur several times. So when you're designing your pipelines something to keep in mind that uh, you, you may get called a couple of times, so you have to do these in an idempotent fashion. Anyway, that, that, that's the main state transition as you go through these streams. And again, the other, the other video um, from the Hong Kong Summit talks about this in, in more detail if you're interested. There's a couple of other demons that run on these pipelines. Um, so there's a, there's a, a script called pipeline.py in the Oahu library which is a, a command line worker daemon and it, there's three different things that it can do one is that it can look for expired pipelines so a pipeline that probably hasn't seen an event come in for it in let's say a couple hours and there, it, it never got that final triggering thing so it's a timeout catch to say okay you know this, this pipeline is just taking too long let's do some processing or put it in an error state or something then there's the daemon that looks for um, ready to triggered pipelines. So that this one now that this uh, this pipeline is has, is ready and is ready to be processed, and this is the one that does all that work. Is where all that complex locking occurs. And then there's a final one that looks for completed pipelines and it purges them out. And that's an optional piece. You don't have to run that if you don't want. But you, you'll run as you'll probably just run one of these or two of these, depending on the load. You'll run a lot of these, depending on how cl complex your your pipeline processing is, and then probably one of these periodically. And then these talk directly to the drivers. Uh, in this case, Winchester, but it could be the you know the MongoDB one. It could be you know some other one that someone else plugs in, and it'll go out and these will all talk to the shared uh, underlying database. So this place, th this component is in place now as well. So that, that's the back-end processing. Now we want to talk about the API on StackTac v3. How do we get outside systems to be able to talk to StackTac v3 and do some work? So we've, we've named things after the old 70s TV show Quincy, or 70s or 80s. But Quincy, if you look at Wikipedia, the, uh, the definition for Quincy was a, a strong-willed, very principled forensic pathologist working to ascertain facts about and reasons for possible suspicious deaths, which seems to apply quite well to uh, event processing in OpenStack. <laughs> when, you, uh, when you do a create instance, for example, and the thing fails, and people start screaming, and you want to find out what happened, you want to have a good audit trail that you can go back and look at and see what happened and where things went wrong. Or if a bill is issued incorrectly, what happened, why? So, you know, the who, the what, the when, the where, the why, the, all, all those important questions about auditing and monitoring, uh, that's what Quincy is all about. So Quincy, the, the, the PIP library for Quincy is the REST interface. So it uses Falcon under the hood and uh, and it, it accepts all these different rest. It, it's a very trivial thing right now. We're gonna. This is a piece that we're gonna be fleshing out a little bit more. But it's a versioned REST API. So there's a V1, V2, V3. It's got you know good support for that right out of the gate. There's a command line tool for Quincy called Klugman. This is the actor was Jack Klugman. So um, 
Klugman is the tool for talking to Quincy. And it's a command line tool, so you can say, you know, show me the results of this pipeline or, or get me this event or, or whatever you like. And also, it's a, uh, a Python library as well. So if you want to embed Klugman support into your own application uh, or Quincy support, you can just use Klugman for that. But there is no implementation in here. So Quincy is just a REST interface. It's, it just deals with HTTP calls. So there's no implementation at all. If you want to use the StackTac v3 API and leave all that other back-end stuff that I talked about, a Wahoo and Winchester and um, and Shoebox and Yagi, and, and you want to, you don't want to use any of that. You've got your own event processor, but you want to keep using the StackTac v3 API. You can absolutely do that. The implementation for Quincy is dynamically loaded, and that's what Quince is. Quince is the one that we ship with out of the box that gives you. Um, access to, you know, the, the StackTac v3 API working with Oahu and Winchester and Shoebox and all the rest of that stuff. But if you don't want to use Quince, don't use it. If you want to have this front end, some other application, make your own implementation of it, put the glue in place, and fire this thing up. And now you've got command line tools, you've got an API ready to go, all you have to do is put this little glue layer in place, which is we're very proud of that. We, we, we don't want to say that this is a definitive implementation of anything. We want people to adopt the API, we want people to agree on the API, and that's going to be the point of discussion for all this stuff. And that's the part of the reason why we've broken out all these little pieces of StackTac v3, because A, we want to be able to use these in other packages very easily, and B, if you don't like it, we'll define the API and then you can make your own interface to it. So we, we've been very uh, open about the design in that regard. So what will happen here is, uh, so like I say, Quincy is the REST interface. Klugman is the command line tool or client library for it. It talks to Quincy using uh, Python requests. And then we use that. We have an import library called Simport, which is a very simple import library. Uh, we don't use entry point based loaders um, because uh, they don't really solve a problem that's meaningful. So this is a very simple way of doing dynamic loading for plugins. Um, so Klugman talks to Quincy, and then we dynamically load the implementation. In this case, we're going to use Quince. Quince uses Winchester and Oahu, which will go back and talk to MySQL. So we can find out how pipelines are doing, how the streams are doing, what our throughput rates are, all that sort of information through this API. And then if someone else wants to put another one in here, absolutely go right ahead. All you have to do is just change the configuration file to point to another implementation. So that gets us into some of the other sort of supporting libraries that go with this. We have a, um, a pip library called Notification Utils, which are just helper functions that all these different libraries can use for dealing with like notification date time issues and, and a variety of different things. Uh, Simport, like I mentioned, is our important utility for plugins. Really, it's just a, a Python import statement. And the only thing that it really does is it just also helps manage the uh, manage the Python path for you, which is really all you want. So if there's a if you've got a local file that you want to use for your configuration information, it'll just add it to the path and then import it normally. There's no need for all this entry point stuff, and which doesn't really solve any any real operations deployment issue. For um, for testing purposes, there's a library here called Notagen. And Notagen is a, a notification generator simulator. So you don't have to have OpenStack running in order to test and deploy and write for StackTac v3. You can use the Notagen library. It will generate notifications that look just like an OpenStack deployment. Well, pretty close. We're getting better on it. But it, it does concurrent, long-term, or you know, temporally ordered correct operations. So you'll get a create instant start going to the scheduler, going off to a compute node, all tied together with a common request ID, and multiple of these that can be overlapping temporarily. So it's a great way to do some testing um, with StackTac v3 without having to run DevStack or any of these other larger systems. Uh, Notabene is just a RabbitMQ uh, consumer and publisher. We use that for writing stuff back into Rabbit um, without having to use Oslo messaging. Uh, We'll probably change this to support some other ones as well. 
So again, very lightweight, very simple, but it's really focused on notifications. We, we don't need all the overhead of Oslo messaging for RPC and you know casts versus calls. This is for ACK and re retry and requeue and all these sort of very important notification related operations. And then Sandbox. Sandbox is our basically our dev stack and Sandbox will fire up, uh, it, it'll git clone all the uh, different pieces, it'll get you a running stack tack v3 with Notagen generating some events and uh, and give you all the, the bash shells and everything just to see where everything is going. I'll show you what this looks like here. So this is what a, st uh, a sandbox session would look like. You'll get a screen session. Uh, in one window you've got Notagen plugging away here which is uh, creating notifications and sending them into RabbitMQ. We've got two Yagi workers uh, which are running Shoebox in Oahu so they're taking the notifications in, they can send it off to um, to Swift or we can do pipeline processing with Oahu in another way, and we have two of these because we want to try and catch those race conditions, you know, that can happen with multiple workers. Then we've got Quincy and Quince running here with an Oahu backend um, for our API. We've got a little bash shell over here that you can use for using Klugman. Th this part is a little bit rough just yet. Like I say, we, this is the, it's going to be coming up very soon in a, in a subsequent release. The, the the shell of it is all in place and it, and it works well, but we just don't really have it back-ended into Oahu just yet. But that'll be coming very very shortly. And then we have our worker demons. So the expired pipeline check, there's one of those. There's a couple of these ready pipeline checks. Again, this is where the locking occurs, so we want to have multiple of these so we can catch those race conditions. And then we have a completed pipeline demon that runs over here in another window. And these are, and these are all using um, the MongoDB driver from Oahu right now. Um, eventually we'll change this out to be Winchester and, and MySQL. The, all the other pieces that it needs are all pip installed into a, a virtual environment, but all these libraries, all those ones that I just talked about in this presentation, are all uh, git cloned and then uh, set up and inst installed from the git clone so you can work directly inside sandbox and edit your code and then see the changes automatically inside the sandbox so it's a very easy simple way to work on stacktack v3 without having to get into all the fancy stand up of, of big uh, dev environments we're really focused on trying to keep dev of stacktack v3 as minimal as possible like I say you don't need to run OpenStack in order to test stacktack v3 and that's everything. I think that's all the major components for now. Um, this is an early preview of, of where we're going and what we're doing with it. So um, we look forward to your feedback and uh, and you know try out the sandbox, get clone it, run it, uh, see what happens. Uh, let us know about any problems. I'm sure you'll run into some, but let us know and we'll we'll be sure we fix those up. And the next video that I'm going to be doing will be a demo of Sandbox, so you can actually see all the different pieces running and I'll show you how that sort of all hangs together. Alright, thanks for your time and if you've got any questions either catch me on IRC or um, you can just uh, put a comment right in on this uh, video. Thanks.